Good evening, everyone. Hope everyone's doing well. Giving it here just another second and we'll get started. Well, wanted to welcome you all here to our winter event, our online seminar to understand more about Advent and introduce you to some of our team members. Uh, I have been asked to host this event. My name is Andrea Henry. I am with the admissions and recruiting office and handle a lot of those back behind the scenes um, things. So wanted to welcome everyone again. Thank you for taking time out of your day. We know that your time is precious and we really appreciate that you're here and hope that throughout this meeting and as you hear from our speakers and hear all of the things that we have to offer, that you'll be excited as, as much as we are to get started and to offer these programs to you and uh, to see what really sets us apart from other on online educational programs. Uh, just to give you a brief outline of our agenda tonight so that you'll be able to follow along. Um, we will have our first speaker, Matt Calloway. He will be our financial speaker and be able to give you guys some insight on that. Following Matt, we have the pleasure of hearing from Adam Brown. And Adam will touch on marketing as well as going a little bit more into depth of what really admin is, what are the things that we have to offer, how it works, the, the different levels uh, that each student might be able to take part of. You know, we have something that, that's really unique with the mentors, and he'll be able to explain all of that. Following Adam, our uh, concluding speaker will be Kristen. She is our HR specialist, professor and mentor with us, and we'll have some great information for you as well. Following Kristen, uh, Adam will go ahead and get some housekeeping things out of the way, and we will go from that point. So please uh, take notes and enjoy what we have to, to share with you tonight, and we hope that you'll be as excited as we are after the program. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Matt Calloway. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, <clears throat> I, um, I, I thought I was speaking after Kristen, but hey, I, I can speak now. Um, my, um, my background is in corporate FP&A. Um, I've spent most of my career uh, in corporate finance. Um, I am from Atlanta, Georgia, originally born and raised. I went to two uh, local schools here in, in Georgia, uh, both for finance undergree, undergrad degree, and then I uh, completed my MBA as well. I started my career in finance with UPS as a uh, financial analyst. And after doing that for a number of years and working my way up the ladder, I decided to get uh, an MBA, uh, and then after I completed my my MBA, uh, I remained with UPS uh, for a little bit of time, and then I uh, moved over uh, to McKesson. Uh, took a promotion with McKesson, and and worked with McKesson for uh, two or three years. Um, both at UPS and McKesson, I did corporate finance um, and, and managed uh, teams of of analysts and senior analysts uh, there. Uh, while I was at McKesson, I uh, had the opportunity to uh, to move over to a company called Change Healthcare. Uh, Change Healthcare was a um, a part of McKesson Technology Solutions. So McKesson had two reportable segments, um, a distribution segment, and then they had a um, technology solution segment. And they decided to divest from that technology solutions business and they spun it off and it became Change Healthcare. And I decided to go uh, with Change Healthcare. And uh, it was an interesting time because Change Healthcare was a, uh, went from a very large private uh, public company, a Fortune 10 company, uh, to a smaller private company that was uh, planning to go public in three to four years. So I had to work on a lot of interesting projects and uh, being part of some interesting discussions. Um, and then most recently, I work for a, a small business uh, called Abacus Advisors, and it's an accounting business, um, and we do accounting for, for law firms, so we kind of specialize in that. So 
that's kind of a general background of me. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm really excited to um, present to you all today. And I, I hope what you find, I hope that what I can uh, present to you is, is helpful to you in some way. And I, and I hope you, you know, get something out of it. So um, I want to start by saying that when you, when you hear the word finance, that may mean, that may mean different things to different people. Okay. So if you work in finance and, and you work for a, an investment bank or you're a financial planner, that's very different than a corporate finance group. So my, my career again is in corporate finance. So specifically uh, corporate FP&A. So what does FP&A stand for? The it's financial planning and analysis. So this, this, slide is showing you a typical organizational chart uh, of a business like McKesson or UPS or Change Healthcare, probably very similar to an Amazon or Walmart or any other uh, <clears throat> large institution. Um, so you have a CFO and that CFO typically has vice presidents that run the controller group, the treasury group and the FP&A group. And I spent my career working in, in FP&A and that is different from uh, the controller and treasury groups, because those groups are um, controller. The controller group is primarily accounting, um, and the uh, treasury group you have sort of a mixed bag of uh, treasury professionals, uh, investor relations professionals, um, and and even asset management type folks. So um, again, I spent most of my uh, my work life there in the FP&A group, and then it's not on this slide, but if you were to double click on that FP&A. Uh, you would you would see that under that FP&A group, there's different business units. So you have you have um, you have a CFO of, of different businesses with, um, within a corporation, and then that CFO will have his or her own uh, FP&A team. So uh, I sat at the corporate level, so I sat above the business units, if you will. Um, they didn't report to my team, but we did the consolidated reporting. So we got all of their data and consolidated it up and, and did reporting on it. So uh, next slide, please, Adam. So I, I've sort of covered this a little bit, but so what is corporate FP&A? So really the objective is cor of corporate FP&A is to provide senior executives uh, detailed reporting. Okay, so they can use it to make strategic decisions and um, they can... They can, they can converse with the board and investors and things like that about the direction of the company. So one of the interesting things about um, our reporting, corporate FP&A teams reporting, is that what you're really doing is you're taking historical data and you're trying to create a forward-looking uh, plan from that historical data, a forecast, if you will. And you're trying to tell a story with it, create a narrative. Um, about how the organization is, is moving as a whole. Um, so and that gives the strategic leaders, that gives the leaders and, uh, you know, the board and, and you know, uh, things, uh, those types of folks, um, uh, a unique vision into how the organization is strategically moving. So uh, next slide, please, Adam. Thank you. So I covered this a little bit. Um, but as you can see from this chart, you have some sort of a basic outline of what a corporate FP&A team will do. So they'll they're, they'll gather data um, that typically that data will typically come from systems in some way. Um, you'll have databases that you can go in and retrieve systems, uh, excuse me, retrieve data. You can perform analysis on that data and you'll create a, a plan or a budget. And that budget, you know, you know, turn into a forecast and then you'll do reporting and the cycle just kind of continues. So that's sort of the basic outline of what a corporate FT&A uh, a, a team will do. So next slide, please, Adam. So how does how do we really create value um, for our um, customers? So once the corporate FP&A team gets that data, again, they're they're doing deep dives into it. They're trying to create a consolidated report that helps uh, executives and uh, decision makers understand the direction of the company. And that's really, they'll apply that to creating long-term strategies for the company. Um, and they'll apply that to discussions that they have with their business partners 
uh, the other business unit CFOs. And it cr just creates this, this sort of global insight that, <clears throat> that, decision, that decision makers can use to uh, make these strategic decisions on. So that's, that's the value proposition that a corporate FP and a team does. So again, it's a little bit different from accounting because accounting is more concerned with a traditional accounting team is more concerned with historical information, making sure that the items are reported correctly um, on a on a balance sheet or a profit loss statement or a statement of cash flows, that 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 actual historical data is correct. And the FP&A team will then take that data um, and then forecast it out as to tell a story as to what the future of the company could be. And that's the value proposition. So next slide, please, Adam. So again, you can have, this is more of a double click on the previous slide, but um, if you look in that planning box there, you'll see that um, you have different types of plan. You have a, a budget plan, you have a headcount plan, you have long range planning. Um, long range planning is, is basically an extended budget, if you will. Um, and then a lot of modeling is used. So this is where, you know, if you're a financial analyst or a, a manager, in a on a corporate FP&A team, you'll we'll need to use your Excel skills to create these models and do various scenario analysis. And then that plan you that plan turns into you know reporting and analysis where you're measuring KPIs, you're creating dashboards, you're doing various variance analysis, and then you're assessing it. Um, you're building out you know rolling forecasts and predictive analytics, and it just sort of repeats in that way. So. I hope that gives you a little bit more insight as to you know how a corporate a corporate FP and A team functions. So next slide, please. Adam. Okay, so what's a typical corporate FP and A team look like? So you know, my experience has been you'll have at least one junior analyst. That's how I started my career, um, and then you'll have um, you know a team of senior analysts. And you'll have an FP and A manager, and that's where you know I spent most of my career as an FP and A manager. Then you'll have a, a director, which I spent a little bit of time doing that before I'm going to go to advocates advisors. <clears throat> and then you'll have a, uh, a vice president or a, or a CFO, or the CFO of the organization, depending on the size. It's a very large organization. It's typically a, a vice president of the corporate fp and team. So that's just the typical structure of, of the uh, fp and team and sort of the reporting hierarchy. Next slide, please, Adam. And I've covered this um, in my previous slides, but you know, I, I oftentimes get asked, "What's the difference between accounting in the corporate finance world? What's the difference between accounting and, and, and FP&A?" <clears throat> Excuse me. And again, really, accounting <clears throat> is really concerned with with what happened. Okay, so recording actual results and making sure they're recorded properly and accurately, and that your financials. And your books are accurate, and that's critical. It's absolutely critical. And then, so the FP&A team is more concerned with the why. It's again, it's telling a story. You got to start understanding the why, so you can create this sort of forecast, this narrative of your forecast as to the direction the company is moving in, and um, how it aligns with the strategic goals and objectives of the organization. So that's really, the, the, really kind of the main difference. Um, is FP&A is really concerned with the why of it, telling the story, creating this narrative, um, and making sure that why those questions um, are aligning with the, the goals and objectives, the larger goals and objectives of the company. So next slide, please, Adam. And so what, what kind of skills do you need? Um, you know, I'll often tell, I'll often tell, you know, junior analysts as I'm interviewing them, one of the, um, common interview questions I'll ask is Excel based actually. I actually give uh, most junior analysts and even some senior analysts an Excel test. Um, so that's really important is to make sure you have um, good Microsoft Excel skills and understanding data. You're gonna be dealing with a lot of data. You gotta be able to manipulate that data and organize it in a way that you can, um, you can understand what's happening. You can tell a story about what's going on. It's one thing just to organize the data and say, okay, the change from prior period to current period is, is X dollars and, and X percent, but that's not what an FP&A person does. An FP&A person 
is more concerned with the story about, about why this is happening. So it's important you can organize the data so it can help you tell a story. Um, oh, do we lose sound? Can anybody hear me? Yeah, I can hear you just fine. Okay. Great. All right, so those are some of this is the skills that you would need, um, you know, gathering data, making sure you have good Excel skills. You can not just gather it, but you can interpret it and make and, and ha ask it, you know, get that data to tell a story for you. Um, PowerPoint um, is also a, a really big um, skill you'll need to use. Um, and then there's various systems that you'll need to be uh, familiar with, um, things like um, SAP, there's SAP systems, there's Hyperion, there's uh, TM1, uh, there, there's a myriad of, of systems that uh, one would need to be familiar with in order to be a successful FP&A uh, person. So next slide, please, Adam. That's really all I have for, for my portion of the presentation. I would love it if anyone on would uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. If you have any questions for me outside of this presentation or just would like to connect in general, I, I would uh, be happy to do it and um, um, would love to connect with you. So thanks a lot. I really appreciate your time. Thanks, Matt, for joining us and talking a little bit more about corporate FP&A. It was really interesting. Uh, a lot of things in there that <clears throat> myself as a marketing person had never really heard before. I didn't really understand. Um, we had a few people chat in um, and appreciate the refresh. One question I had for you, I'm going to go back to a slide, um, was on this typical org structure. Can you talk a little bit just for maybe a minute about the difference between what you would see in a large corporation and what you might see in like a medium sized company? From a, are you asking from like a, a, a typical team structure. Yeah. Sort of thing. yeah. So for a, for a large company like McKesson, you will certainly have a junior and senior analysts. Um, this is this this chart is very representative of a large organization. Um, with a small organization, you will probably not have a junior or senior analyst. You'll probably just have an FP&A manager and some sort of director slash vice president of finance slash CEO. So that the, the, the team becomes much smaller and you um, inherit a lot more responsibilities, wear a lot of different hats. Um, so that's, that's primarily the, 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 the big difference there. Okay. That answers your question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. All right, um, Matt, we appreciate you being with us tonight and talking a little bit more about corporate fp &A. I think we're going to transition now to Kristen, who's going to talk a little bit more about um, human resources. Um, and he, Kristen, are you ready? I am. I am all set. I'm going to turn my camera on to say hi, and then I'll turn it off during presentation so we're not distracted, but so that you know there is an actual uh, corporeal being on the other side. This is me. I am in a office. Please don't look behind me because you do not want to know what's going on back there. So I just want to say hi to everyone. Welcome. I'm going to turn this off now. Um, so yes, that is me. And I am the reason we had a little bit of a snafu earlier. So I apologize for that. I was rearranging some things uh, very last minute. So uh, thank you uh, for being here and for inviting me to be here with everyone. Uh, my name is Kristen Irie. I am technically an employment law attorney. Um, please don't hold that against me. Um, but my area has been actually non-practice uh, working in human resources for a couple decades now. I won't say how many, um, but it's been a little bit. So um, I, I love human resources. I'm very passionate about it. I think it's an amazing career opportunity and it's a great career path for anyone. Uh, especially now because there's so much going on. As we know, there's so many moving parts to our, our new way of, uh, of working. It's a new world. So uh, next slide, please. So as I said, I am an attorney. Again, don't hold it against me. Um, 20 plus years in human capital management. Um, I use that term because it's much more all encompassing than just saying HR. HR used to be that dark, scary office that hires and fires. Human capital management is a much better explanation and a much better term 
because it really captures uh, how human resources is under that umbrella. Human capital is a much more strategic approach to human resources, especially you know, in the new millennial, this is how things work. So um, my specialty is I'm an organizational architect. What that means is I build talent, I build organizations, uh, I help design, I help implement, and as you can tell, I love doing it. So that's please. So we'll talk a little about uh, H uh, human capital, HCM. Um, why is it important? What, what's the point of having this particular area uh, within an organization? Uh, talk a little bit about some of the career opportunities. Um, and again, the why. What, what's important about this? Because uh, human capital management really focuses on how to maximize an organization's resources. And those resources include people. So, yep. Next slide, please. So the way that I structure courses and the way that I teach, because um, I have been doing this for a, a while now, again, I won't say how long because that ages me a little too rapidly, um, but I enjoy setting up the video lectures. I do synchronous. I do asynchronous. Um, we talk about assessments. The way that you best learn human resources, human capital, or even if you've been practicing, there's always more to learn um, if you're pursuing this type of education, is taking real world problems, creating projects that have real world application, creating succession plans, doing evaluations, looking at how performance management shapes organization all that cool, fun stuff that nerds like me love. Um, the way the courses are structured is the content supports what's called the BOC. Uh, it's a nice little industry term you get to learn tonight. It's called the body content of knowledge. Um, there's several industry groups like Society of Human Resource Management, Human Resource Certification Institute that have certifications that you can obtain and it communicates to your peers and to the world that you are a subject matter expert. Um, and the content within this program supports that. So you have that reinforcement if that's something you really want to pursue. So thank you. Next slide. So I pulled this headline off the internet because I was so excited to see it. So as HR transforms, it's becoming a cool career choice. Finally, after 20 plus years, I'm cool. I'm excited. This is fantastic. Um, human resources is transforming. It's transforming how businesses work, how they run. There are uh, forces that are external and internal. Right now, we're all trying to figure stuff out. Um, one of the biggest demands that have been put on an organization during this pandemic has been human resources. We need skilled leaders. We need people who can understand these challenges um, and address them and come up with real solutions that aren't just immediate fixes, but what are the long-term solutions? So human resources, you have multiple levels, you have multiple areas, you have recruitment, you have performance management, you have training, performance development, you have compensation or what's called total rewards, uh, you have obviously management and leadership and executive leadership. So there's multiple levels. Um, some of the positions within a human resource function, um, you have a HR generalist. That is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, jack of all trades, master of none. But they are a subject matter expert in many areas of HR. Um, you have a specialist. A uh, specialist is very common level um, within an organization for targeted things such as compensation or leave or disability. In larger organizations, you could have many specialists that cover every single area. In smaller organizations, you may just have generalists because you never know what walks in the door every single day in human resources. Um, I've always laughed when people are like, well, you know, we want you to speak on this panel and talk about a typical day in human resources. Hello, there is no typical day in human resources. If you enjoy variety and you are flexible and you can recover and you can keep moving, HR is a great career option because it is never, ever boring. 
I, like I said, I've been doing it for a while. I can never look back at any single day in my career where I said, wow, that was a really boring day. Never. Because HR has to be flexible. It has to be able to meet challenges head on. And this, we don't know what those challenges are until you know they, they arise. We plan we do forecasting, we do all those things. We take the data and the numbers uh, that Matt was talking about earlier, um, but we have to be able to put real world solutions based on data-driven information. So as you get higher up in an organization within human resources, you see a lot more of the strategic links and how HR is a driving engine of any organization. So next slide. So as I talked about recruiting, compensation, performance and development, compliance, there's executive leadership opportunities. Right now, uh, human capital management, the overall area of HCM is facing a knowledge drain. We need people in HR and in HCM who are ready to meet the challenges. We've had a mass exodus from uh, human resources, mostly due to retirement and due to uh, people decided to exit early or do whatever or go into different fields and uh, use their expertise in uh, other ways. So there is a need, there's an ongoing need, a growing need. And it was funny, um, Human Resources uh, was listed with the Bureau of Labor Statistics only last year as a growing field when many are still contracting and being outsourced. HR was listed very high on growth opportunity and very low on outsourcing opportunity. And as I've said, I've been teaching for a while and what I've always told my students, if you want a career that you can grow into and grow with and expand, HR is a great opportunity. If you just want a job, you probably don't want to go into HR. But if you want a dynamic opportunity for your career, to expand and grow and learn, HR is awesome because it's changed by compliance, by rules, by laws, by regulation, um, by organizations. Organizations need HR. Until organizations can figure out how to operate without people completely, with no people on staff, they will always need HR. Uh, so there's many career paths. Uh, for people in that area, you can work directly for an organization. You can work for, I work right now for a municipal government in Texas. Um, I'm actually the deputy city manager here. Um, but uh, I started as the HR director. <laughs> but, you know, there's many opportunities. So uh, the skill sets that you gain as a, a human resources practitioner um, are boundless because you learn real leadership, you learn management, you learn how to be dynamic and flexible. And that's what organizations need for their, for their you know, to lead them into the next generation, to the next future. So uh, next slide, please. So I could talk for absolutely ever, but I do not want to do that and torture everyone. Um, but, you know, I am very passionate about this. I always make myself available. So if anyone has questions or follow up, or even if you're not, you know, specifically not sure of what you're, you're looking for for a career in HR or you want more information, find me on LinkedIn. I am always happy to answer questions. I'm always happy to set up a phone call, whatever I can do to bring more practitioners into the fold, because this is my passion. This is my life's passion, my life work, and I, I really enjoy it. So um, my presentation's a little short, but, um, I thank you all for your, your time and tolerating me and listening. And uh, please follow up. I, I'm happy to uh, provide any answers to any questions that I can. And I thank you all for your time. All right. Thank you so much, Kristen. We appreciate your time tonight. Um, I was a little surprised I didn't see any pictures of Toby from the office as much as people tend to like HR people, right? <laughs> Toby's the antithesis of what you want in an HR person. So we, we try not to, but yeah, I, I've done presentations where we had adjustments of 2020 where everything was on track. And then of course the pandemic, 
uh, you know, not to sell kilter. So, you know, we had toilet paper shortages. We had everything. I mean, it's not thunder outside you hear. It might be Godzilla because this is 2020. So we're ready for anything. <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you again so much for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Everybody be safe. All right, so I'm going to spend the next little bit of time. Uh, by the way, this is this is Adam Brown. Um, I'm going to be talking about marketing. Um, I'm going to talk about a few really exciting recent uh, marketing campaigns that I've seen in the marketing place. Uh, excuse me, in the the um, marketplace, and uh, then I'll talk a little bit about Adamant and some of the different programs that we offer and how they can help students in in different situations. All right, so. First off, I always like to do with a, like Matt and Kristen both did a little bit of a get to know me. Um, so as you can see on the screen, I've got a lot of logos on here. Um, I did spend a good number of years at JP Morgan Chase working in um, the analytics and marketing departments for mortgage and some other things. Uh, while I was there, I had some really great experiences. I uh, worked on some really small campaigns that were targeted at you know, one in two cities at a time. Also worked on some really large national and global campaigns that were multi-million dollars that uh, taught me a lot of things. I also worked at Farmers Insurance and Marketing, um, helped agents in local areas uh, really work on getting deeper roots into their local marketplace, as well as help them with some national campaigns that they did there. Um, and then lastly, I worked as marketing faculty, as well as um, helping Arizona State build its reputation and brand in Phoenix, um, most recently before coming over to Adamant. Now, this is something I also always like to do. So now you've heard how, you know, my work history and, and how I'm known on a resume. Here's how Amazon knows me. So here's some recent purchases that I've made on Amazon.com. And as you can see from the the different images on the screen, uh, when you put analytics and, and marketing together and use these digital outcomes, you start to realize why so many companies, um, why you see ads from so many companies for so many interesting different products. Uh, if you were to look at this along with a database of hundreds of other products I've bought from Amazon over the years and most recently, you would start to realize why I'm seeing so many ads for the products I am across multiple channels um, digitally. So I always think this is interesting to look at. All right, so let's start off with um, Gartner's tech trends. So Gartner, very well respected um, market intelligence agency. Um, this is something that they put out uh, just last year. And what they're saying is, you know, essentially we know that technology and the way that we interact with it is undergoing a radical transformation. It has been for, for some time, but it's becoming even more radical as we go throughout the next few years. And you're going to see some things in a few minutes that'll kind of prove that. Um, one of the things that's really uh, taken, taken off in the marketplace is augmented reality and virtual reality. And some of how we're mixing the two together when, and what they would call um, you know, Im immersive ambient experiences. So let's talk about a few of these. So um, first off, Clear Channel, a company that is best known for their billboards, really, but they do a lot of other advertising. Um, they got together and partnered with some weather and dating apps to purchase GPS data. What that means is anybody who had um, a weather app or a dating certain dating apps that they purchased data from that was live dynamic data, um, the, Clear Channel had access to the GPS locations of all those people who had those apps. And one thing that they did was really interesting was they partnered with McDonald's. Um, and what McDonald's did was they used this GPS data and they geolocated all their billboards that they had ran um, nationwide. And anytime somebody with one of those apps was near a McDonald's billboard, they sent them a notification to look up at the billboard. And um, it had mixed reviews because sometimes we know that technology is following us, but we don't want to know about it. Um, but interestingly enough, they did see in some areas about a little, little over a 10% increase in the visit rate to their typical restaurant traffic that they would have in those areas. And so they really attributed this to the partnership that they made with Clear Channel. Um, interestingly enough, uh, there were there were a lot of negative things that came out of this as well for McDonald's. So we all know, you know, that Burger King loves to troll McDonald's. Uh, one of their most recent things is um, that McDonald's lost the 
the trademark on the name Big Mac in uh, the European Union. So Burger King has really been trolling them a lot there. But one thing that Burger King did to kind of offset this thing that McDonald's did was Burger King created a, a portion of their app that you could go in and hold your phone up to a competitor's billboard and then touch the screen. And it would actually set fire digitally to this competitor's billboard. And when you did that, it would give you a coupon for a free uh, Whopper. And so Burger King, before the campaign, expected to give away about half a million burgers. Now, one thing that comes to my mind when I see this is, you know, in traditional marketing, you're thinking about typically, okay, how much money am I going to spend and how much money am I going to make? You know, what's my return on investment or in the marketing world, what we call Romy, return on marketing investment. And these kinds of campaigns are becoming more and more popular and have increased uses in the marketplace, even though they don't necessarily have a definite uh, return that marketers can always um, measure and prove. Uh, here's another great example of one. So Chipotle takes to TikTok. Um, so just recently, a few months ago, uh, Chipotle ran a guacamole, guacamole video on TikTok that resulted in over 500 million views. And you can see the image in the background. It was a uh, a person dancing to this song that had been made up about guacamole. They shared it on TikTok, just kind of trying to figure out what they were doing with the TikTok channel. It got 500 million views. Um, it ended up that they, they sold 800,000 sides of guac um, on National Guacamole Day. Um, and they attribute this TikTok video to a lot of that success. And so you're, you're starting to see that some of these digital things where you really couldn't exactly measure um, perfectly, you know, of the 500 million views, how many of them really bought sides of guacamole? But what they're saying is we sold 800 sides. That's the most we've ever sold. So it had to be because of the TikTok video. And so a little bit less measurability, but a lot more interact interactivity with uh, consumers. Another really interesting thing that Chipotle just recently did um, was a they had a contest um, where a Florida woman won $10,000 in the Chipotle TikTok challenge. So what she did was she created a video on TikTok of her sleeping outside of a Chipotle, um, it, kind of on the patio uh, with a pillow and blanket and everything. And then she goes um, and wakes up and goes into the Chipotle and gets you know a morning drink. And then she goes back at lunch. And in between, she's studying and she created this um, viral video that won her $10,000. And they also, um, for a limited time, put her version of what the burrito bowl should be on the menu. And some of these examples, you know, and this one specifically, what you're seeing is Chipotle trying to engage consumers to do the marketing for them. Um, and this can be really effective because it has a lot more genuinity to it than you might see from a you know, corporate Chipotle marketing team. And one of the most interesting things ab about this is um, because it is just a fan making a video, um, people see this and they, they get excited about it and they want to be involved in it and they want to go order the bowl um, simply because she won this contest. And um, this is really becoming an, import an important trend in TikTok, even though you know, we've heard a lot of the negative things about it in the marketplace, we all have to stop and think as you're thinking about marketing, how can I reach my consumers in a different way? And the reason for that is because uh, the marketplace is aging. You know, every year the marketplace gets a little bit older and every year a little bit more of the younger generation comes into the marketplace and the older generation goes out of the marketplace. And now what you're seeing is companies are starting to adjust their marketing strategies in order to reach these younger consumers. All right, so from this, let's talk a little bit about what, what we call in the marketing world is the, the market services marketing triangle um, or just the marketing triangle. And this is, if you look here on the screen, you've got your company, your customers, and your employees on each point of the triangle and then technology in the center of this. Um, what's really interesting is as you move from company to customers to employees, you'll see um, as we go through this, how technology kind of impacts and is embedded in everything that we do now. Um, when engaging customers and employees. So the first part of the triangle is the company engaging to the customers. And we typically refer to that as external marketing. And so, you know, I've got some things listed here, social media, digital marketing, apps, billboards. Um, you know, the thing that McDonald's and Burger King did with Clear Channel and that partnership is a good example of digital marketing um, or a search ad that you might see on um on Google or Bing or someplace like that, or a digital ad that you might see on Pandora Radio or, or Spotify. 
Um, the thing that Chipotle did with TikTok, obviously this is an example of social media, but what's interesting is the more that social media develops, it becomes more than just a bucket of social media, right? So anybody who's used Facebook and Instagram, even though they're owned by the same company, you realize that they're, they have quite a few different features, um, even though they have become a lot more similar since Facebook purchased Instagram. And then the same thing goes for Snapchat or TikTok or you know any other social media um, platform is they're really trying to differentiate themselves. So it's become... Harder and harder, you know, when, when social media really first started back in 2004 with Facebook, um, a lot of companies were just starting to hire people and usually they hired one person to do social media. Um, and then the invention of tools like Hootsuite where you could manage all of your social media in one place became really popular so you could still have one person running it. But now we're to the point where um, really you, you need a team of people managing your social media channels. And this is all due to the popularity in social media and Things like Chipotle taking over um, TikTok have really become important for companies to focus on now. So in interacting with your customers, the company really has to be um, thinking far, far ahead about things that are coming, thinking about the future and what new apps might roll out that really might take off. Um, another really good example of one is uh, an app, app or website called Twitch. Um, a lot of you have probably heard of it before. I, I taught at Arizona State a few years ago and kind of um, learned about Twitch after it had been out for a year or so. And really interesting to see all the different advertising opportunities on Twitch. I mean, there was a point where um, the NFL was partnering with Twitch so that uh, consumers that were playing the games um, on Twitch could rent these NFL jerseys to put on their character. Um, all different types of partnerships and things happening. The, the bottom line is when your company is contacting your customers, you have to go where they are. So you really have to identify your target market. Um, it's becoming more and more important to really know who your customer is and think about what age group they fall into or what income bracket they fall into or all those things that make up who they are. And then really consider and think about where are they in a physical environment? Where are they online? And how does this impact how I'm going to reach them? Uh, the next part of the triangle is interactive marketing. And this is the marketing that happens between employees of the company and customers. So um, for those of you who might not have seen it, um, the London tube system or subway system in the city of London hired a 14-year-old kid to manage their Twitter account for a while. Um, this is a really good example of interactive marketing. So um, very, very similar to the Wendy's roast, um, that you saw on Twitter, this 14-year-old kid managed um, the Twitter account for um, the London tube system. And a lot of the replies and responses and tweets went viral because this person who they hired was just so funny and had such witty responses. Um, and what they did was they transformed their Twitter board. So it used to be a board completely full of complaints um, about the trains being late or not serviceable or not running. And then it turned into people were going on there to be entertained. And so having somebody who's really witty and can come up with great content run your social media channels is important, even in interactive marketing. Another thing that you see a lot of now is are chatbots. Um, chatbots are uh, bots that respond to you automatically. Salesforce has developed a lot of these. They, they created a really large partnership with Adidas um, a couple of years ago, and they rolled out a service bot for Adidas that you could text back and forth with. You could do things like change your order, change your delivery address, get a refund, make a return, all with interacting with a bot and not a person. So the interactive marketing piece is, is very interesting. All right, and then lastly, internal marketing. So um, this would be from the company to the employees. You know, 10 years ago, this would just be an intranet website and the company would post all of their updates um, right on the top of that intranet site or they might send it out in the e company email newsletter. But I think by now, most companies have figured out that employees don't really read those because they're always too long. Um, so they've developed a lot of internal applications or mobile apps to interact with their employees. Um, I know when I worked at J.P. Morgan Chase, they had rolled out all these different apps um, from how to manage your finance to how to manage your health um, to, you know, maps for the building or locations that you might work in. Um, 
all so that they could interact with their employees. And they had these um, programmers or app developers who developed these apps and then customer service people who would manage the interaction. Very, very interesting. So that kind of concludes talking about the marketing triangle and how companies, customers, employees all kind of interact with each other. Um, there are obviously some examples of things going really wrong uh, with these. If you look at the external marketing piece, um, if you all remember from a couple of years ago, uh, Burger King, you know, they're famous for trolling people in ads. Uh, they had a TV ad that prompted everybody's Google Homes and read the menu items of the Whopper to the person um, because the commercial was able to activate the Google Home device. So if they had one in there, it came on and then read the in ingredients of the Whopper. What was really negative about that was because Wikipedia was the number one link for that, people just automatically started going in and changing all the ingredients to the Whopper, so much so that Wikipedia had to take the page down um, when, the, when the campaign ran. So a lot of really interesting things happening in marketing right now, especially with AI and digital. Um, did we have any questions from the chat? Or do we have any questions in general? If not, I'll keep moving on and um, you can feel free to type in uh, the chat box there. All right, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about Adamant. Um, Really, the goal of Adamant was to help students um, who were in difficult situations that weren't really addressed by typical higher education um, or by K through 12 education. Um, here's a quote that I always like to use from the Chicago Tribune. They do a lot of uh, surveying of students. Um, they asked a potential uh, prospective student group going into college just last year um, if they would be willing to take on debt to cover college bills and only 11% of the respondents said yes, which was down from 20% the year previous and down from 33% the year before that. Um, one of the biggest research trends with the next generation of, of students um, is that they're much more debt adverse than the millennial generation was, and they would much rather work while they go to school to pay off school as opposed to having loans when they graduate. Um, and this was from a recent small business magazine talking about small business owners. Uh, we also target a lot of programs towards small business owners. And um, one of the things they said was make sure that you take advantage of online classes, webinars, and tools to learn and increase your business intelligence. A lot of business owners finish their degrees and then just start running their business, and they get so busy and caught up with doing that that they don't realize they're missing out on opportunities. Um, there's a lot on the screen right now, so I want to just kind of talk through it real quick, and then I'll make sure that we send this recording out as well as the slides as a follow-up so everybody can refer back to it um, when they'd like. So I want to talk about three students just for a minute, um, Hannah, Michael, and April. So each of these students is a little bit different. They have a little bit different situation um, in their life, and they've got a little bit different of a problem and opportunity. So if, look at the first student, Hannah, um, on the far left. She's 19 years old a recent graduate of cosmetology school and currently works at a salon. She really wants to open her own salon one day. Um, so her biggest problem is that she needs business skills to start a salon of her own. Most cosmetology schools don't offer business trainings. There are one or two that do, but most of them don't. Um, the problem with her needing business skills is that she can't spend four years on a business degree after just completing cosmetology school nor does she wanna go into any more debt than she already has. Um, next, let's take uh, Michael, for example. Michael's a little bit older, he's 23 years old. He earned his bachelor's degree in English. Um, he was planning on being, I guess, a famous poet or writer someday, but it turns out that like a lot of English majors, he ended up working in marketing um, because they're good writers and marketing definitely needs good writers. Uh, he works as a marketing specialist at a uh, large organization, but he wants to become a marketing manager and lead a team. Um, the difficulty is that because his bachelor's degree is in English and he doesn't have a lot of years of experience, it's tough for him to really make that pivot to leading a team at this point. Um, he really needs to deepen and hone his, his digital marketing skills. He doesn't want to just watch videos online without someone to guide him. There's a lot of experiences out there right now like LinkedIn Learning or lynda.com things of that nature where you can just watch videos. But um, the problem with that is he needs someone to guide him. Um, doesn't want to incur the cost of a master's in marketing degree, but he still needs those skills. 
And then lastly, April. Um, April is the situation that I was so closely in when I worked at J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, she's 28 years old, earned a BS degree in business. So she went to undergraduate business school. She was recently promoted to a finance director position at her company. And she needs to update her leadership skill set. In addition to updating her leadership skill set, um, she's always worked in finance. Now with this new promotion, she's going to be managing a little portion of the operations or project management part and needs to update those skills as well. Um, her biggest problem is that she doesn't want to incur the cost of an MBA, but she needs those diverse skills. Um, she needs a mentor to guide her, just like Michael. Um, but she doesn't want to just watch videos online and she can't go into any more debt. Um, this is the situation that most resonated with me when I was um, working at J.P. Morgan Chase and thinking about doing an MBA. As you know, the cost of education is continually on the rise. There are some affordable options out there, but not many. And with every day, passing day, higher education gets more expensive. So this is why um, the, the board of Adamant came together and it got together and came up with a solution for these types of situations. Um, looking at the adamant solution, we work one on, or excuse me, your mentor works one on one with you to earn your certification. So unlike going on to just a learning platform and watching videos and getting a certificate, you get one on one interaction with a trained mentor who has more experience than you do in their field. And they can really help you put what you're learning in the classroom into real world applications. Um, and it's nice that it's one on one as opposed to, you know, a lot of times what you see in higher education is classroom is difficult for the professor to really help everyone. And a lot of times the professors have research backgrounds. Um, our certificates are curated by those and developed by those who are professors and have experience developing curriculum and coming up with great learning opportunities for students. I think I mentioned affordability, but in most cases we're 50% or more less than most universities or colleges. And then lastly, we use the same materials as major business schools do with um, new innovative tools. And so what you see is, you know, we use Harvard Business Review cases in a lot of our classes. Um, we use the same type of textbooks, although they're optional purchase for the student. We use the same type of innovative textbooks and some really neat simulation tools to really train and hone students. But the learning just doesn't stop at the classroom. You get this mentorship opportunity. I mean, with that, I'm going to kind of pause. I know that's a lot of information. Again, we're going to send out the recording and the slides. Um, the last thing I wanted to cover was kind of the process of how a student would come into Adamant and graduate. So um, unlike other learning platforms, you do have to fill out an application. And the reason for this is we want to make sure that if you're in the situation of Hannah, Michael, or April, that you get paired with not only the right mentor, but that you also get matched with the right certification program that meets your experience level and skill set. So then you from there you get paired with your mentor, you learn from the professors, your mentor will work with you as you work on your project. So the emphasis in our courses are projects. Um, you work on a lot of those and your mentor is ultimately the person who pass or fails you for the course based on your project performance. And then once you complete those required courses, you complete the certification program. Um, we have several different levels of certification programs, and that will be part of the follow up that I'll send out. Um, I don't want to um, give any more information because we're almost out of time and um, it's a lot of information to take all in in one hour meeting. So with that, I'll pause to see if there's any questions. I don't think there are from the chat. Um, yeah, let's just take a look. OK, so the last thing that we want to do is announce the holiday giveaway winner. Now, if you noticed um, in our post on social media, you did have to attend the meeting as well as register for it. So um, we are going to announce that person now. All right, so um, the first place winner is a $100 gift card to Amazon. And the winner of that is, uh, according to the randomizer, Daniel G. So Daniel, if you'll uh, send us a direct message on LinkedIn or um, Facebook, 
Instagram, one of the social media channels. Um, we'll get in touch with you and get that uh, prize to you. Um, we're also giving away two t-shirts to second and third place uh, winners. Uh, Jonathan, looks like Jonathan Ellis is our second place. And then Crystal P is the third place. So um, exciting uh, to win a $100 gift card for coming on to an event. Uh, we appreciate you being with us. I uh, wanted to let everybody know this, what, this is our first recruiting event um, of this year, and we appreciate you coming on. Um, and let us know uh, if you have any other questions or comments. Andrea, did you want to wrap us up? Yeah, that's great. I am, I'm really excited to be able to kind of absorb all that information. I, those are not my levels of, of expertise or, or focus. So I actually learned a whole lot. So I'm, I'm sure that our people here that have joined on have, have absorbed that as well. So uh, please reach out to any of us on the, on the board for any questions. Uh, we will be following up with an email um, to make sure that, you know, we can answer any of the questions to get you started and, and to move forward. So Looking forward to having more contact with all of you and, and working with all of you to to give you what you need with, with admin. So thank you all so much for coming. Stay healthy, stay safe, and enjoy the rest of your evening.